Awesome team. So welcome back everybody. So we're here for shift tactic number 12. So we're in the final day of our shift book series, book club, if you will. We really didn't call it a book club, right, Taylor? It was just like a, hey, show up and we're going to read the book. Yeah. Should have called it a book club next time. I agree. We'll call it a book club next time. So we've gone through the last couple of weeks. I mean, wow, it's, I think we're, this is the end of the second month that we've been uh, going at this and every week or two, or every week we've been covering one or two tactics in the book. And we're finally at shift tactic number 12. Uh, and as I'm looking down, not looking at the camera guys, pardon me, I'm just, uh, all my notes, everything is in the book uh, for those that are watching this on recording later. Um, so let's go right into it. So the, the tactic again is about bullet, bulletproofing the transaction issues and solutions. Um, so the book does a really good job in this chapter of talking about some of the big things um, that can come up in a transaction and will come up in a transaction to ruin it for you. And man, I'll tell you, uh, it's been a test lately, not only from what I've been experiencing, what I'm seeing our, our your peers experiencing, there's a lot of things making transactions fall apart right now. So I'm going to highlight some key things in the book that it talks about uh, in regards to bulletproofing it. And then we'll spend a, most of our time actually talking about, uh, and it starts on page 246 for those that have the book, we'll spend a lot of time on the six uh, bulletproofing the transaction issues and solutions. So we'll spend some time discussing that. Um, this is interactive, guys. So um, Mike, Gwen in the Naples training room, please feel free to be near the computer to unmute yourself. Uh, Christina, feel free to... Uh, jump on camera and uh, and chime in at any point. Um, anything you want to add in, and same thing, Susan uh, and Taylor, of course. So let's get rocking and rolling. So as you all know, I like to read from the book directly. On page two forty one, it says, "Just when everything seems to be going right, something goes wrong. Typical transactions are now atypical. Nothing works like it once did. Real estate transactions aren't particularly trouble free." in any market, but in a shift, few sales are easy and almost all closings a challenge. I'll stop there for a second, I'll read some more. I remember a time post, or yeah, uh, post COVID, so COVID hit, market slowed down for a little bit for like a few months and then it just jumped up like crazy. And you guys probably remember this where literally you list a home and it was what? 10, 20 offers above list price, no contingencies, free tacos for life, free, free, hey, I'll let your seller stay in there for two months. I had one seller, uh, not my seller, uh, I was on the buyer side, who let my customer, or I'm sorry, my customer, my buyer let the seller stay in the home for two months past the closing, free rent, just to get this deal together. So go ahead, Taylor. I was just going to say, wow. Oh, thanks, Taylor. <laughs> I'm engaging with you. <laughs> so no, so it's interesting, right? Because it was a matter of, for a little while, the sellers were like, what are you going to do? What are you going to offer me? What are you going to give me to keep this, to put this deal together and keep it together? Right? So, and now it's not the, not the case. Um, would you guys believe, so I have one listing that is now on the contract for the fifth time. Fifth time. So what's the history of that? The fifth time over what time period? I'll give it to you um, as we're going through the book. I'm going to use that house as an example because I'm going to tell you what. I'll be vulnerable for a second. I probably should have read this chapter before I started dealing with this house. <laughs> no, no, you know what it really taught me this chapter as I read it and 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 and, and relate to that experience is that it proved the point a few months ago, a year ago, I could sell a house on the list side, on the buy side, either side, and it was going to get done. Both parties were motivated and both parties were going to get it done. Both parties were not going to let little things get in the way. And really when I say both parties, really most of the weight was on the buyer because the buyer could say, Hey, um, these items came up in inspection. And you know what that conversation looked like? Well, Mr. Buyer, um, the reality is, in this market, if you ask for requests of repairs and credits, you're probably not going to get it. And they're going to go to their backup offer because most mm -hmm. homes have a backup offer. And that was the case. A listing agent can say, no, we have plenty of other offers. Take it or leave it. And guess what the buyer had to do? Taylor, this is where you can engage Christina. What would the buyer do? 
or decide to make those repairs themselves. Exactly. Exactly. They took on that house no matter what. Things are different now. Um, so I'll go back to that house, uh, Christina, as we go through it, because um, it's interesting for sure. Um, it proves a lot of points of this chapter and uh, just no judgment and don't make fun of me. But I, I like, I can't sell a house apparently. So that's kind of embarrassing. The next thing in the chapter says, what makes this market especially tough? And I'm still on page 241, by the way, for those who have the book, I'm in the, right in the middle. It says, what makes this uh, market especially tough is the apparent willingness of buyers to walk away at any point in the sale. When everyone believes the market is heading up, buyers are afraid of missing out. And when everybody believes the market is heading down, buyers are afraid of sinking with the ship. That sums up at a high level, Christina, what's happened with this house. I can all get into some more specifics. On, two, on page 242, we have Susan in the house. Yeah, I don't know what was going on. Yeah, Susan's in the house, so she's listening in with us now. Uh, on page 242, uh, first paragraph, it says, buyers are simply more open to an opportunity to rethink, renegotiate, or even break their contract. As they listen to the media, fellow coworkers, friends, and family, buyers are likely to question their own judgment. What do you guys think is happening, Christina, Taylor? Susan in the room. What what are you what are you what are your interpretations of why buyer, buyers are doing this? Because interest rates are going up, and I feel like there's so many things going on, and they're hearing we're gonna go in a recession, we're in a bubble, all these, all this chatter, and I feel like it's really feeding into kind of validating these feelings. Yeah. Absolutely. Did you want to add anything to that, Christina? Mm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about something, but it's not a fully formed uh, idea yet. Um, there are people who have been sitting on a lot of cash. Um, so I'm not sure what may um, make those people think this way. Yeah. Well, here's the reality, too. Inventory is going up. So in the market that I was talking about, where it was like a take it or leave it, it was also because there was not any other option to, to look at. Mm -hmm. Now there is, we're seeing a lot more price reductions. We're seeing homes come back on the market and a lot of them are starting high because they're thinking this is six, nine months ago. Mm -hmm. And yet a lot of them are reducing their price, making more options available for buyers. And because of that, they're, uh, more open to call, uh, canceling a contract. Um, on, to, on page 244, it talks, it says about uh, being having heads up. So it says here, um, no one else is going to do your due diligence for you. It's entirely up to you to oversee your contracts from start to finish. You have to be good at both ends of the sale, making it and closing it. You do your deals heads down, but you save your deals heads up. Heads up is about seeing what's coming. It's about being vigilant. And it's about being prepared to act. I'm gonna stop there for a second and go back to that story with that house. So what 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 I interpret and what I hear here is that it takes skill not only to get the home on the contract, but actually keep it on the contract and get it to the closing table. Susan, go ahead. I feel like you have something you want to. Yeah, that's say. exactly where I'm at right now. It's exactly. Yeah. I don't think they they um, they trust you. I think that they feel like. They're waiting for you know a better deal, or that they'll even wait it out because the price is going to drop. You know, it's just trying to guess where. That's not you said. Interesting, says so I don't trust you. Um, that's that's an interesting one. So like you're talking about the buyer side not trusting your judgment and your feedback on the market and what's happening. Well, yeah. A while ago, in a good seller's market. You can almost guarantee you got it on the contract. It was going to close. You were almost you were pretty, you were pretty much at the bank already spending the money. Can I be vulnerable with you guys? I did the same thing. I would count my what is the saying? Cat count your eggs, whatever. Oh, How, who would Taylor? You know the saying? Count your eggs before they hatch. Yeah, you know what? I I did a little bit of that when the market was like 
six, nine months ago. I did some of that. I was guilty of it. I know my peers are guilty of it. I won't say their names because I'll let them decide if they want to share that with you. But I know they were guilty of it too. So as we think about the real skill right now is again, it's keeping the contract together. So it's getting it to the closing table um, and the being diligently, you know, being aware of your surrounding, having your heads up. I think that's a key thing. So I'll tell you like with this house that we're, that I keep telling you about. And here's the thing. Oh, can we predict everything that's going to happen? No, Susan says no. Taylor's a no. Christina, no. No. Yeah, we absolutely can't predict everything that's going to happen. And yet, can we be aware of the roadblocks and stumbling blocks that are possible so we can mm -hmm. have a plan in place to overcome it? Absolutely. And that's what the chapter really uh, gets into. Um, but before I get all there, uh, get to that part, one more thing I want to read from the book for you um, from this section. It said, this is on page 245 again for those following along. Uh, second to last paragraph. Remember, you can predict exactly what can happen but you can't predict what, when it might happen. Assume everything will go wrong and come up with ways to possibly prevent them from happening or effectively deal with them if they do. And we're gonna talk about that here in a second. So on page 246, this is an entire list. Pretty much from 246 is the list of everything that's discussed between pages 247 and it goes all the way to page 260. All those pages for those that want to go back to it are a deeper deep dive at the strategies of, again, well, not so much the strategies, but like what can go wrong and some solutions for them. So uh, I'm going to go through a few here with you right now. And then uh, the next thing we'll do after that is we'll look at two, uh, it talks about in the chapter, two timeless strategies to help prevent issues. So let's look at it, the six issues that can come up and we'll spend a ton of time here. So the first one, and uh, Catherine's on the call now, Catherine, feel free to jump in at any time. Um, uh, as I'm going through this uh, right now, we just kind of set up the fact of the fact that, you know, things can go wrong and will go wrong right now. Um, hold on, let me Thank you. And I'm sorry, I am uh, late. I had that doctor's appointment. It just took forever. Unacceptable. I'm just kidding. I hope you're okay. <laughs> I'm playing. No, I'm I, can play with, I can play with Catherine, everybody. I'm not heartless. Catherine. Yes, you can. Okay. We do this all the time. It's all right. It's all right. All right. So let's look at page 246. So the first issue, inspections and repairs. Oh. Unmute. What can go wrong here? Unmute yourself. Everybody that wants to chat. Everything. No. <laughs> The roof, the roof tiles. The roof is on fire. The air conditioning needs to be replaced. AC needs to be replaced. What else? Mm -hmm. Mold. What was that, Catherine? Mold. Mold. M-O-L-D. Yeah. yeah. Mold. Yeah. What else? Pests. Lots okay. of little bugs. Yeah, the list is endless. So here's what it says in the book. So what it talks about, so unexpected findings, right? It can be anything. It could be everything you just discussed. And I'll share some things that came up um, in the deal that I was referring to. So how do you solve for that? Sellers get a pre-inspection. Mm -hmm. Unless it's new construction. And even then, I feel like those are being picked apart. There's a feeling with the buyers paying more price for their home now than they did two, three years ago. There's an expectation almost like that all these homes are just going to be brand new, nothing wrong with them, no cosmetic issues, and yet there is. So one piece of advice is have your sellers uh, have a pre-inspection where you see fit. You know, a new construction home that was built last year in the last two years, I'm probably not doing that. I'm not making that as the primary suggestion to bulletproof this transaction, but that house built in 05, 06, probably a good idea. Yeah. Um, the next thing here that can come up is uh, re report complexity, meaning the buyer gets their inspection report and it just scares the crap out of them. Mm. Scares the crap out of them. When does that happen? It happens when either A, you have an inexperienced inspector who doesn't know how to articulate the report it could come from a buyer, nervous wrecked, who doesn't know how to understand the report. 
it could come back from it could come from an agent who doesn't know how to uh, interpret the report and explain it to a buyer, or it can it can be a combination of all three. A complex inspection report, and here's the thing: anyone who's done an inspection, you know that there's some general language almost on every page of the inspection to protect the inspector. That general language scares them. So, uh, Christina, to your question earlier, that's uh, on. I would tell you on one of mine that was that came up. That's my first one that came up. It was a combination of a couple other things, but I think I had um, definitely on one of them. And this last on the fourth time, um, it was definitely uh, being scared away by the inspection report. Yet when somebody else with an open mind and understanding homes and 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 what it takes to maintain a home, like oh, these are regular maintenance items. Right. Yeah, I think too, Jordis. Is I think it's really, really important for all uh, for all of us to have very good relationships with really good home inspectors. Yep. And yep. even when customers can choose their own home inspector, make sure you check them out and understand them. That can break a deal very easily. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting, right? Uh, I've seen on this same house, one inspector take three hours, another inspector take an hour. I probably would say there's an issue with quality there. So uh, there's a lot of things I would have done different with that one. And yet here's the solution in the book, which is in line with what my thoughts are, attend with buyer and or seller. Traditionally speaking, I wasn't at inspections ever before for on the listing side, buyer side always. So Jordis, can I ask you a question? Please. So you attend a home inspection for your sellers? No, 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 I, I have never. Oh, okay. What I'm saying is, because we're talking about a shifting market and we're talking about a solution for these complexities uh, and what I've learned from this house that gave me some challenges and still is giving me some challenges is, how do you uh, handle uh, complexities is being in attendance, answering the questions of the inspector and the buyer in the moment, not letting okay. things build up and, and, and turn into something bigger. Okay, Go I'm ahead. sorry, I thought you had said it as you would be there to represent the seller and that I would not do. And well, again, we're, we're talking about a shifting market and we're talking about bulletproofing the transaction. Yeah. There's one potential okay. solution. This is one potential solution for you. Go ahead, Taylor. So cool. Tara Carter, I believe, was the one that said this, but she said that we should never do that because yep. it's making us liable. There's here's what I here's what I'll tell you. It, it, what is general? What I generally do not go. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a very specific market that's doing this. Right. Mm -hmm. We're looking, we're giving you ideas and issues and solutions to them. Mm -hmm. if, if we continue to operate how we always have, then we're gonna get what we always gotten. And in this case, could that have been one thing to avoid the complexity? It's only one of five solutions. So right. I would not get too caught up in the details or, the, or uh, there's gonna be some outliers in some situations where I, I, I wouldn't, generally speaking, I don't. However, my thought right now with experience from a house that's given me troubles, is could I have prevented issues by being there? Uh, and, not, and not so much for the buyer side to talk to them, but hey, inspector, what are you, what's your issue? I'll talk to the seller right now. We'll see if there's, because a lot of times I'll, I'll give you an idea um, and we'll move on because it's a pretty big list. Um, something as silly as light bulbs. Tell me how many switches are in a room. Oh, I can't get this to work. You know how many inspectors just do this, this? And if it doesn't work, they just mark it down as it doesn't work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And mark it down as an electrical issue. Exactly. Now you take a buyer buying their first home and they and they they're reading on the report says there's electrical issues, the lights don't work. You tell me how that's gonna be taken. Yeah. They're panicking. Sure. So again, just a tool in your tool belt. Uh next thing, uh cost and who pays. So all the, you know, having all these complex issues that come up uh or the unexpected, like the roof and the AC and, and who's gonna pay for it. So how you do how do you solve for that? Pre-negotiate. Yes. Put, put some pre-negotiation limits. That's the one thing I will tell you 
that I do love about the far bar regular contract. That's one thing I do love about the far bar regular contract. Um, so if you have a home that has a complex issue or you know it may run into issues, up front, you can pre-negotiate how much can go towards repairs mm -hmm. and uh, maintenance or whatever, however you want to word it. Mm -hmm. Catherine, you want to add anything to that? No, I think, uh, <clears throat> am I muted? No. No, you're good. <clears throat> I think it's, um, it's really important. I know there's a difference between the regular contract and the as-is contract, and that's one of the reasons why the regular contract is really good to use. And always can renegotiate when it's something major because the seller does not always know you can have a home inspection they could find out there are things that are wrong with the roof that if the inspection wasn't done no one would have known and in that case keeping a good relation the agent relationship is very important because that's also key in negotiations absolutely and then the next two guys are um, having time. Uh, so timetables for repairs, uh, be select and supervise vendor, supervise vendors. Um, so, you know, meaning if let's say you do agree upon something um, like I had a roof one time where the buyer was just like, no, I don't think it, like they didn't want to, we a seller agreed to repair, but the buyer just got very nervous, Nancy about it, I guess you could say. Um, and um, they didn't think it was going to get done. So they ended up walking. Um, so just having good vendors, I think is also a good solution for you to make sure some of, some of those repairs that are minor can get done. Um, and you know, what's interesting to Catherine and her point, I remember last year, earlier in the year, there was a deal that closed, um, and there was mold in that property and it was only like a four-year-old property and the seller had no idea. There was a huge buildup of mold in the AC unit which then cause issues with mold buildup in the carpets. Wow. Yeah. Now, um, when you mention the vendors, um, do we have a kind of a starter list at the office, something that new agents who don't know a lot of vendors can just take and say, hey, these, um, these are the ones that our office yep recommends is, is there such place where we can see that yeah you can get with nikki she can get you our preferred vendors list up front you can look at our wall that we have right when you walk in that has vendors here at marco there's an area as well for our vendors and what a, a lot of agents do is they'll go on the facebook group on the private group and say hey team i'm looking for i'm um, looking for a plumber to do uh piping replace pottery butylene piping and golden gate estates who do you know and uh somebody in the office will always make a recommendation of who they've used as well Okay. Yep. Thank you. All right. So inspections and repairs, again, are the first big issues that could come up. The second one is uh, appraisals. Okay. Appraisals. So one of three things will happen. Either it won't support the price, won't support the loan, or it just doesn't match the CMA. Like it just basically the appraisal goes wrong. And do we see a lot of that? And we're going to see it more. With everything that's going on with the market right now, we will see more of them. Yeah, yeah, we do. We did see a lot of that. Now, remember, in the market we're coming from, most of these offers were being uh, some language. There was included language on it: a buyer will waive appraisal contingency. Why buyer will cover will bring in difference between appraised price and contract price. Mm -hmm. That was being negotiated up front. Now I think we're going to see a lot less of that. So how do you handle that? So a couple of solutions right. it talks about is uh, provide appraiser with research. Have your comps ready to go. Mm -hmm. When you list your property, highly recommend that you save that comp, that data, and put it in your DocuSign room so it's ready to go at any given time for you to download and send to your appraiser, print it, bring it to the appraiser. Yep. Um, other options, find additional buyer funds. I mean, that's what a lot of buyers did. Maybe instead of doing 20% down, they were doing 10% down and using the rest to cover the mm -hmm. gap. Yes. Uh, uh, and then appeal the appraisal, which um, I don't know about you, Catherine, but I rarely see that one go well. No, I, I'll tell you, I've been doing this for a little while and I have seen very, almost never, it almost never ever goes well. And it also leaves a very bad taste <laughs> yeah with company and so forth so um i don't typically unless it's absolutely outrageous i don't ever recommend doing i don't typically recommend doing that i just don't think it's wise so what i would think about 
there's so there's two sides, right? There's the seller side and the buyer side. From the buyer's perspective, what I'm keeping in mind is is there a possibility you may come in on a list price and it still be over and still may not appraise? How do you prepare your buyer for that? Because here's the thing: some sellers are they going to adjust the price when the appraisal doesn't happen? When it doesn't come in contract price, some some sellers are not going to adjust. Mm -hmm. And then and, and guess who's out of luck? Who guess who, who guess who's losing money on that deal? Right. And I, I think that's one of the things that's really important during our buyer consultations is to go over all the different scenarios that could possibly happen so that our buyers are prepared. A lot of times we don't, you know, especially with everything going on the past couple of years. People are just in such a rush. They're not taking that time to have a full out consultation with their buyers and explain all this to them. Yeah, yeah. Their knowledge and, and that's, that's part of building your report and your relationship with your customer. And it's very, very, very key to do that. Yeah. So you think about you're protecting your buyer initially going up front with, uh, into the deal. Um, think about from the seller's perspective, this came up, it was, it, it, this came up a lot. I remember I had a house in Cape Coral. Um, this is like, this is early either. It was late 2020, I think. And at the, is a two bedroom house. The house is worth two or five. I think that's what we ended up selling. And it was like two or five, two ten in Cape Coral. I had offers up to uh, three fifth or uh, two fifty. I'm sorry, from one um, individual, and my, my seller was pretty savvy, and I already had this conversation with him. And do you think that seller went with the three uh, the two fifty offer? We had multiple offers, anywhere from two hundred to two fifty. This is a savvy seller. Did he go with the two fifty? Smart seller. Well, so, yeah, this is a savvy seller. seller. He he I did. He didn't because we knew up front it wasn't going to appraise. So where I'm going to with this is that you, from a seller's perspective, that's another way you bulletproof your transaction is understanding up front, hey, somebody's coming in with this outrageous offer with no appraisal contingency, uh, no language to you know say they're going to bring in the additional funding. This is where you educate your seller on, hey, is this a good deal or not? Because it's no longer about just getting on the contract. It's about getting it to closing. Getting it to closing. Exactly point is you wanted to get it to closing contract exactly. contract is a contract but a closing is the closing yep all right third issue um loan approval and funding there's a couple issues that come up here first one application delays now that's just silly well does it happen does Go it ahead, happen Catherine, what are you gonna say I will tell you that yes, there are application delays. I know in the, um, especially in the last couple of years, there have been delays because mortgage companies have been just overwhelmed, totally overwhelmed. So there have been app, you know, so there have been some delays with that. Um, I think now, educating, I think having that relationship with our mortgage consultants so that we understand what our buyer has done, where they are in the approval process prior to putting them into contract will help us avoid application delays. I Absolutely. don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah, and there's nothing here that's 100% guaranteed. Um, well, you're actually right. You know, the solution they have in the book here is uh, be selective and you know, your originator and, and get that pre-approval, not a pre-qualification. See how much the lender has already pulled up for this file, for this individual. Have they already looked at bank statements, W-2s, et cetera? Have they already pulled credit? Have that conversation uh, with that challenging deal that I'm talking to you about. After the second one, we had to do that with every, every opportunity or every one after because one of them had an issue where uh, it actually, this is a second buyer. There was a couple of extensions. Long story short, the buyer paid off something they shouldn't have, which actually hurt their score, thought, thinking that it was going to help them. So they were in partnership with the lender there. Um, and the other issue was the credit, uh, um, uh, the rating increase that also caused uh, issues here. So we mm -hmm. had to then moving forward, start talking to every lender prior to accepting an offer, which 
it's a great practice regardless of the market we're in. It is, you know, I also have, I have a sheet. I know I think I gave it to Patricia, I'm not sure, but there's a sheet uh, um, that I have of 10 things buyers should never do um, when they're purchasing, right, you know, when they're purchasing their home and they're going through the approval process. And that's one of the things on them. Got that communication with the buyer and the consult and the mortgage person in you is paramount and key yep. to it. Well, for those following along in the book on page 253, there's actually a list of seven don'ts of mortgage funding. So yeah. take a look at that on page 253, because it's a nice list of things that your buyers should not do. Um, moving on, um, uh, documentation problems. So assist buyer with paperwork. Sometimes the buyer just doesn't know where to look for something. So sometimes you need to be more hands on and helping them out where and pointing them in the right direction. A uh, third thing that comes up here is buyer credit issues. What can you do about buyer credit issues? Hmm. This one should be this one should be resolved before we go under contract. Yeah, I just gave you an example where it happened during the contract. Yeah, before. Yeah, have a good understanding of where they're at, right? The whole pre-approval process is very critical here. And just to, uh, for everybody watching live and later on, there is a major difference between pre-qualifying and pre-approval. Yeah, and I will I don't advise any agent to ever to, to take people out to see tons of properties who is not really approved. And if you have a reputable mortgage company, they'll actually give you certain certification that shows how far their approval process yep. is. Absolutely. Yeah, so the suggestion here in the book, so get credit counseling for your buyer. So I definitely always highly recommend have a, a credit person to go to. Uh, mm -hmm. You may run into situations when you're doing a buyer consultation and doing the pre-approval that they're not ready right now credit-wise. So they need to do some counseling before they get there. So these are things you want to do up front because Actually, David, our lender in Naples, he, he can tell you, we actually had a, a customer that we worked together who like, it was like every week something was happening in his finances to impact him in a negative way. And we had to stay on top of it because we just knew, although his, uh, when we started said he was pre-approved, um, there were things that we knew were happening that were going to cause him not to be, right. whether it be cash going out or things that were impacting his score. Mm -hmm. The next thing it says, lender failure to approve, um, reapply with corrections is the recommendation there. What I, what I would say with failure, lender failure to approve or fund, um, the thing that comes to mind for me, so like moving mortgage, for example, they've made a pretty good name for themselves uh, in their loan rescue uh, loan package. Or what, is that their formal name for it, Catherine? I think it's loan rescue? Yeah. Loan rescue, yep. Yeah, they've been pretty well known for that. So actually that deal that I keep referring to, one of the suggestions I made before we terminated and the buyer lost their deposit was, hey, you might want to call Movement Mortgage. Do you have a contact where you're at? Do you want me to give you a contact I have here locally for you to mm -hmm. see if this file could be safe? Correct. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, buyer credit changes. I mean, we've already talked about that. Um, what, and actually the solution is to Catherine's point, give pre-closing credit warning, um, essentially the do's and don'ts. Give, give them the do's and don'ts so that they don't get negatively impacted as we're going through the loan process. So after, uh, after loan and approval funding issues, the fourth thing is other contingencies. So a few of them that are listed here, sale of the buyer's house, any third party approvals like home oh, must be approved by an attorney, must be approved by spouse or whatever contingencies are put in the contract. Um, could be a short sale approval if that applies, or it could be a clouded, uh, like a title issue. But the one that comes up the most right now, um, for at least that I've seen, Captain, go ahead and chime in, but sale of another property is a common one. Yeah, sales of another property. And I know that come across a couple lately that have had trust issues. <clears throat> there you go. Trust or probate issues. But sale of another property, Sellers are so used the past couple of years of dropping a sign and getting anything that uh, contingencies to sell your home is something you really have to negotiate. Yeah. It's well, it's interesting, what's interesting, simple. Catherine, it, it, there was a time frame where it's like, don't even put that contingency in there because you're not oh, going to yeah. get a house. Yet now that's what's happening. 
It is. We're, we're back to that again. We're back to buyers asking for closing credits and we're back to buyers asking for a contingency on a sale of a property. I know. And this is so exciting because this is when real estate is really fun because there's all these different things you can negotiate. I've been waiting for this for a couple of years. So I'm okay. excited. So a solution for this one is take back a offers. Yeah. Take back up offers. And then beyond oh, that, um, it doesn't say this in the book. Um, and yet when you're accepting an offer or looking at an offer, considering one that has that contingency, some of the things I would be looking at is like, hey, Susan, you're the one sending me the offer. Is this property on the market? I don't even ask it. I just look it up myself. I'm like, let me look up this property. Is it even on the market? My, and if I'm just having that dialogue, that's my first question. Susan, is the property on the market? Is it under contract? Okay, great. Is it past the inspection period? Okay, great. Is it past the appraisal financing contingency period? Where is it at? It's Where is it at? Because here's the thing. When they say to me, oh, it's not on the market yet. The agent's going out there on, on, on Monday or on Tuesday after 4th of July. I'm like, well, then why are you sending me this offer? Now, granted, right. if, I don't, if I don't have offers and I'm in a heavy buyer's market, I still may be looking at this. So I will tell you right now, we still have options, but there's going to be a point where we won't. That's right. Where we won't. And that is the offer that we need to negotiate and work on. Yet, what can you do again to bulletproof it? it well, it's to ask those questions and have clear expectations with your seller. Hey, they are not on the market. Or hey, they are on the market. They're past these phases. Here's what, what, what I'm learning about this deal. I looked up the deal myself, the home. I looked at, I reached out to a local agent because I don't know that market. I looked at, I looked, reached out to one of my KW peers out there and he says, hey, yeah, this, you know, well, well, well price, et cetera, or whatever that conversation is. Do your own due diligence to help your seller make a decision. And also if you have the buyer, you need to, uh, a buyer, you need to make sure that that customer, that if they're going to, to look at houses, to buy houses, their house has to be on the market if they have to sell it. They can't wait till the last minute. And that's the preparation of conversation that you have to have. It's different now. You just can't wait anymore. Well, it's interesting because we were, uh, I would have in, on this property we keep alluding to, uh, there were multiple offers that were made where it was a contingency on a sale, but the property was not on the market. They wanted to wait till they had a deal. I'm like, well, you're not going to get a deal because you don't have your house on the market. So your offer is no, like it means little to us right now because we had enough others who weren't contingent on, on something like that. So, uh, so after other contingencies going uh, um, off the rails, uh, number five, co-op agent, either bad advice or communication, inattention to details or, or, or poor vendor selection. So let's talk about bad advice or communication. How can the co-op agent be a, a major issue in the transaction for you? Anybody have an idea? Taylor does. She's going to unmute herself right now. Um, they're not being responsive. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not responsive. What else? How can a co-op agent put a wrench into this? happen pretty easy. Christina's got something. She's ready. Look at her. She already unmuted. <laughs> Hi, Christina. Well, um, it was already mentioned communication. So maybe um, communication breakdown between the agents. Yeah. You know, Some if you think agents are not, not all it agents are trained and educated the way we are at Keller Williams. Keller Williams takes a lot of pride in making sure our agents are educated properly and trained properly. So a lot of times you're just gonna come across agents that have absolutely no clue what they're doing. Yeah. Well, and you know what comes to mind as I'm hearing everyone's comments on this is generally speaking, we get the deal in the contract on the list side and like, wait, all right, we're good. Let's buyer because the buyer's agent is the one that has a ton of work to do right now. They got to schedule inspections, 
you got to deal with that with rapport. You know, they do a lot of heavy lifting. Um, and yet there's still a timeline we got, we had to follow. So whether you're on the list side or the buy side, I'm pretending to be on the list side here for a moment. I want to not assume the buyer's agent is doing their part and meeting all their uh, contingency dates. Uh -huh. I need to be ahead of it. Hey, Catherine, um, July 4th is coming up and that's your last day for inspections. I know with the holiday coming up, you probably have plans. I know inspectors probably are, have plan, uh, plans. Maybe you're even your buyers out of town. Where are you on the inspection? Is it gonna be done on time? And if it's not, you gotta have, or you have to have a conversation with the agents, the buyer, with everyone to, to make adjustments because they'll lose the deposit or they'll lose their right to do, to even negotiate anything. Yep. Yep. Relationships. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Susan. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, so I'm actually jumping ahead a little bit here. I just want to read this because it's just very fitting here. Um, I used to be guilty of this. So this chapter has really tested me a lot. You know what I used to be guilty of? No news is good news. Oh. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, no God. news is good news. I used to believe yeah. that. I used I, to believe that. Yeah, that's not true. No news is friggin' scary. That is exactly no news right. No news. Exactly right. So oh. um, make sure that the solutions on here. So again, clarify the messaging, make sure that you have good intentions, the agent, and just open communication and just don't assume they're working the, they're the process. You stay on top of all the contract dates yourself, uh, whether you're on the list side or the buy side. Um, and then the last piece, it deadlines. So just not meeting your deadlines as it relates to inspections and repairs closing date, occupancy, approvals, documentations that need to be turned in is everything we just talked about, being on top of your dates. So how do you do that, right? Um, there's a lot of different ways. Well, first off, if you're leveraging your contract to close, your contract to close person, whoever's doing that service for you, they track those dates for you and give you alerts and communicate with the other parties. Um, you can also use command. You can utilize the, the opportunities feature in command um, and you can take it from active to under contract and walk through each stage and you can actually make your own task list reminders. You can throw that, it in your email Google calendar. And Go that, ahead, by the way, the command, that's something that we're going to be going over with you guys, because that is key for you as an agent to understand how to use that and how you, you can best utilize that. You can put in your effective dates for your deposit. You can put in your effective dates for your mortgage. You can put in your effective dates for your inspection. Everything can be right there and it will send you task alerts. Yep. Absolutely. So as it relates to deadlines, just make sure you're confirming appointments in progress, uh, build in buyer and seller flexibility, uh, preset dates, limits and penalties and manage, manage the closing checklist. Uh, they gave to you on page, uh, for those following along, on page 260, there's a contract to close checklist of date expected, date completed, and there's 22 items on there, 22 items in a contract that you can be following up on. Uh -huh. So that list is already provided to you right there. Additionally, um, and Patricia, if you're listening right now, you can pull this from Eric at Naples, there's a task list that KW has, one for buyers, one for sellers that you can also uh, utilize to create your custom task list for yourself and your business. Uh -huh. So there's tons of task lists out there that you can uh, implement and command to help keep, help keep you on top of things. So the next thing, so after, uh, so once we get any other comments, Kathy, before on, on these, any of those six uh, issues that come up before I move on past it? No, nope, go ahead. Oh. All right, so we got the six issues, got some ideas on how to overcome each. On um, page one, or 261, I'm sorry, it talks at the bottom, it talks about two timeless strategies. And it says, uh, one is proactive prevention and two, early response. The first one keeps everyone focused on the positive. That's a proactive uh, prevention. It keeps everyone focused on the positive. 
intentional, adaptable, and certain achievement of the goal. And then the second one, which is again, early response, focuses on the responsible players, usually the agent and the vendors on awareness, accountability, problem solving, and the customer sensitive uh, handling of issues that come up. Um, on page uh, 262 to through 260, 267, it goes a little bit deeper uh, into uh, how do you use proactive prevention and how do you use early response to bulletproof your transaction. And ultimately all of it is about, uh, so if you look on page, or those following along on page 262, it talks about uh, outcome framing. So it says, uh, what do we want to achieve? So this is about being proactive and preventing any issues. So what do we want to achieve? What do we realistically need to consider? What will we do if, uh, so thinking about alternatives and we're on track ahead of the game and doing fine. It's that reassurance that, hey, we're moving forward. And then as issues come up, whether they're communication issues or inspection issues, problem solving things, um, it gives you some like lines that you can use kind of like almost like a script in a way that you can use to help you with, uh, with you know, presenting options and whatnot. So. That's the big one. Let me see here if there's anything else I highlighted I wanted to share with you guys. And then we'll spend the last 10 minutes just kind of some Q&A and dialogue. Um, yeah, the last thing on here was just already what I shared with you. So no news is good news is never an option for a sales professional. So yeah. don't fall guilty of that. And that is it for shift tactic number 12, bulletproofing the transaction. So what questions are out there? Oh, come on. Nobody has a question. They're thinking. They're in think mode right now. I'm going to think. pick up my highlighter here while you think. Of all these issues, um, which ones do you see as most common in the current market? <laughs> oh, boy. So, um, I've been running into primarily inspections and repairs as my main issue. Second, financing. Mm -hmm. Financing. I, I would agree in that order. Thank you. Yeah. The yeah. financing one team, you got to just remember things kind of, I don't think they changed overnight. They were sudden and gradual. I mean, it's not like it came in overnight. I mean, we, so when I bought, I'm going to stop recording. When I bought in 2020, I, you know, the rates were under three. Right. And it was slowly started seeing it creep up eventually creeped up to the point where I remember in 2020, I was buying, I was telling people this, I'm like, hey, I'm buying, I'm taking advantage of the market, I'm selling, I'm gonna get into a place, uh, I wanted to take advantage of the rates. And others are like, oh, I'll wait till the rate goes down even further or the bubble. Yeah. Now, well, there is no bubble and, now, no and <laughs> rates are double that, almost three times that for some people. That's right. Do you know those rates in the eights and nine that some people are getting? There are, they're in the eights and nines and understand with people in the eights and nines, their purchase power that used to be at 800,000 is now 550 to 600. It changes, yeah. changes everything. And well, and an interesting to, thing to that let's perspective here in the grand scheme, it, we're still historical low rates. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just remember we're, that in the grand we're, scheme, we're still historical low rates. I, we had a conversation about this at a leadership meeting we had the other day and Holly was even sharing with us here at Marco. She, she remembers a time when she was paying 16%. 21% to Susan. Yep. I bought. There you go. Yeah, you do. When you got it, when you have to buy, you buy. Yeah, so, so Christina, those are the two I see. I agree. Great question. Thank you. Who else? Could be related to the topic or anything else that's coming up to mind right now. This is kind of, you, you got us. Um, we'll leave the recording going so anybody watching later can get value from your questions. Are people going on appointments on buyer appointments right now? Taylor, are you going to any buyer appointments, Susan? Have you been doing any buyer appointments? Not lately. Okay. No, not right now. <clears throat> Up, so get get ready because it will all <laughs> here's your cat um, i know he always likes to say hi that's okay so you know you need to i think it's really good that we are you know starting on 
uh, the topic of working with buyers because it is going to start. We are going to start having more activity and you need to be very educated and prepared. Yeah. So I'll tell you, um, my, so for, uh, for group coaching, I think I've shared it with a lot of people. I'll just repeat it again. Our goal as we move forward is focusing Tuesdays on sellers, Thursdays on buyers, and then Wednesday kind of doing a group session together online where we can, you know, focus on other combination of both and technology piece. Uh, tomorrow, yeah. uh, Catherine, my intention tomorrow is to start getting the outline ready for the buyer presentation and getting everybody acclimated for that piece. I am um, doing exactly good, good because I'll be doing that via um, either Zoom or Google Meets because I'll be at the airport. Yeah, you'll be at, look at that. She's dedicated. She's going to be doing this call in the airport. I appreciate you doing that. Um, so Naples, meet me in the office up front and we're going to get into the buyer uh, consultation process. And I'll tell you, in this market, uh, I, you know, I, I, I kind of have this conversation with buyers, too, and sellers. So at the end of the day, don't judge me for the problems that come up, right? Because the reality is that there are so many different moving parts to a transaction, different issues that come up. You know, judge me, rate me on how well we handle each one and the solutions we come up with together. I won't know every single problem we're going to have and which ones we're going to face or not face. We'll, have, we'll come up with a solution for each, though. So um, that solution. Say it again. There's always a solution. Yep. Well, I think the key here where I'm going with this, too, is that the, that presentation is that time for you to set the standard. Hey, we're going to have problems. We're going to face them together. We're going to deal with them. Um, and here's what the market's doing and preparing them for making a good offer. And you're their trusted real estate advisor. Absolutely. We got five minutes still, team. You got us for five minutes. Take advantage of it. Doesn't have to be specific to this topic. Anybody have anything going on right now? They need guidance or just have questions on? Hey. I guess we've started retaining our people Captain. pretty good. Keep the conversation going, Captain, for me. Absolutely. Okay. Does anybody have any at all? I know that we're going to start doing, um, you know, working with the buyers. So we're going to start educating you a lot more with that. Um, people have open houses they're going to. I know, Taylor, you're doing open houses. Susan's been doing open houses. Um, what about Christina and Vanessa? I don't know how long you've been here. I'm very little, so I'm just starting Hi, off. Hi, Susan. Jordis. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, hi, Jordis. No, you can't. <laughs> My um, Zoom's not working, so. <laughs> um, yeah. You will, you know, when you're new, you don't always get um, high activity right away, but you will. Hmm. So, Nobody, you know, we don't all start out with having kinds of things going on. How about a open house buyer's presentation? Because many times that's the first time that we're actually capturing somebody and they're quickly, we're, you know, to master getting information from them and getting them to take your app, Keller William app, or have you research properties for them. Um, that's, you know, that's like the best time when you've got them right there. Um, well, I think what we'll do is I'll talk to Jordan yeah. and I can't find a pen. Why can't I find a pen? Um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. No, I do. I And I think that we do need to do that. They would like to have, they need open house classes to really know how to buyers who are coming in and sellers who are coming into open houses. So Jordan, you and I need to talk about that and when we can do that yeah well i'm thinking we incorporate that on a wednesday class this is a great conversation yeah. around where like that's a cost for everybody and we'll do that on a wednesday then so yeah. for everybody watching um you know because well, most of the people watching here there's gonna be people that are not in the coaching program watching in the coaching program just so we're clear tuesdays and thursdays we're always going to make it live in the office Wednesdays, we will open it up for Zoom okay. to have some uh, an opportunity for all of us to be together and learn on a topic we yeah. all need to learn on. But on uh, Tuesday, Thursday is definitely going to be more intimate and like belly to belly mm -hmm. in the office. Okay. Um, the intent is that this is the last class that we have for shift uh, in this format. 
So next Wednesday, we can actually start our next week, uh, next Wednesday, Catherine, we can do the open house class. That'd be yep. great. Now, I will be on Zoom all next week because I'll still be in Boston. Yep. So Patricia, you're watching. Um, can you please, uh, for Wednesdays now, as we move forward, uh, only for the coaching clients, uh, you can set up a Zoom link for us. Uh, for Wednesdays um, at 1.30 to 2.30, like we have been before. Tuesdays and Thursdays will still be live in the Market Center. Correct. And I'll send out a Zoom link for uh, Marco. For, for, for tomorrow? Next. No, Tuesday and Thursday next week. Oh, yeah, because you're going to be at, yeah, yeah. So you, I'll let you handle that separately. But Naples, yeah. Naples, you'll be with me in the office. Uh, and then Patricia will send out the link for us moving forward on Wednesdays starting next week. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you all. Sorry. Go ahead, Christina. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> thank you very thank much you. for your time. My pleasure, guys. Have a good one. Everybody be good. Thank Have you. Have a good day. Right. See you. You too. Thank you.